Hi everybody, uh, welcome to uh, this session. Um, I'm, I'm delighted to introduce Sophie Mason, who's coming as, to us from Somerset, in what looks like a lovely studio there. Um, and I'm just going to hand over now to Sophie, and if, you, if there are questions from the floor, um, I'm sure those will be handled by the chair in the space and related to us uh, here in the backstage. Okay, thanks. All right, over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm just going to try and share my screen so that... Um... <clears throat> Hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really, really grateful to be here. And um, thank you to Minu and Richard and everyone for putting this on. And I'm very honored to be presenting alongside so many extraordinary people. It's, um, it's quite a thing that you're doing. Um, I wish I could be with you all, but it's been impossible to get to you. Um, I hope you're all having fun though. Um, so I've been invited to talk a little bit about my work. I gave a talk at uh, Art.Earth's First Friday Talks at the end of last year, um, which was a very, very sweet and nourishing experience for me. And um, I was very moved by the performative, the interest in the, in the performative aspect of my work, which is something I don't normally talk about. So I thought today I could talk to you a bit about that, that body of work, um, which I've been doing for about four years and a body of work that's come out of that. And um, yeah, just look a little bit also at the performative side of it. Um, and then perhaps if you have any questions, we can try and uh, kind of have a little conversation via the, via the chat if there's time um, and you're able. I think it's quite complicated maybe, but let's try. Um, so a little bit of background about me. Um, I live in Somerset with my husband and my daughter, and um, as well as being an artist, I'm also a food grower and a cut flower grower. And I've worked in community gardens for about 10 years, teaching people how to grow food. Um, and alongside my solo practice, I also have, I run um, collaborative art practices uh, exploring ecology and climate change and um, community and well-being, normally through the lens of a garden, which has been very special because it's sort of brought my art practice and my gardening work together. So it feels like um, the gardening is kind of an extension of my art practice. Um, I, yeah, so my art, my solo practice, it changed very dramatically when I moved to Barcelona about five years ago. And this body of work has come out of that. Um, I, my, my husband's Spanish and we moved there with my, my newborn daughter. And um, I was going through those intense changes of early motherhood, um, which also triggered um, the a, a return of a, a kind of very chronic illness that I've had since I was about 14. Um, which meant I had a, a very practical need for slowness and um, I was in a new city and I also needed to find an art practice that I could do with my daughter that could kind of just fit into our everyday life. Um, and alongside that, I was there was also something about the, um, the fervour of this new relationship with my child that I was experiencing that broke something open for me around the interwovenness of relationship. Um, I was reading that her, st her stem cells were in my body, that they were moved, that, that when she was a fetus, they'd move through my placenta, uh, the placenta and into my um, bloodstream and had lodged themselves in my breasts and my thyroid and my brain. I mean, every mother, this is. Um, and that, um, yes, the milk that, I was producing had sugars in it that couldn't be digested by her stomach, but could only be digested, but were there specifically to feed the microbes in her, in her guts, um, microbes that had arrived specifically, um, had arrived because they'd specifically congregated in my cervix at that particular moment. 
like a, a, a kind of a range, uh, a, a range of different microbes so that they could populate her as she passed through and out into the world. Um, and alongside this, I was reading a lot about symbiosis and um, in particular, a biologist and writer called Scott Gilbert, who's really, really fascinating if you don't know him. And um, there's a passage in his work that I wanted to read to you because it's so beautiful. Um, he writes, the discovery of symbiosis throughout the animal kingdom is fundamentally transforming the classical conception of an insular individuality into one in which interactive relationships among species blurs the boundaries of the organism and obscures the notion of essential identity. Um, and that just sort of blew my mind, really. Um, I read another paper where the human body, um, I can't remember the name, but I can find out um, that they were describing the human body as a super organism. Um, so I was reading about all about this stuff and I was reading about mycorrhizal fungi and forests and their relationships and the relationships by, between coral and, and the algae that live in them. And it just felt, um, I just have had this sense of these, learning about these kinds of ecosystems within ecosystems and this um, kind of um, multi-species entanglement that's just constantly moving and relating to it, um, itself. Um, and much of which was and is disintegrating around us, just as um, scientists have the power to see what's going on, the technology to see it. And so I was reading about all of this stuff, and and then every time I um, every time my every time my daughter slept, I I wrapped her in this blanket that a friend of um, mine had made her, and over the months it was deteriorating and it was softening and through her touch and it reminded me of my childhood teddy bear that was like started to fall apart through love and it reminded me of um, medieval icons that um, had gone smooth through devotional gestures and I wondered if there was a way that I could do that um, in the context of my relationship with the landscape and so I started my, blan my blanket series which is um, this is one of them. And um, so I'm, I'm using the, the fabric of a, mord a mordanted canvas um, uh, to go out into the landscape and document my experiences there. So the canvas works as a kind of um, intermediary between my body and the world. And over time, the accumulative stains after often years of being out um, the canvas sort of, it feels like for me anyway, starts to um, track a, a kind of, it becomes a kind of map of care of the relationships that I have within the landscape. Um, and I also, I also collect paint, uh, plants and dye um, and, and minerals and I will dye them um, with the uh, uh, back in the studio, I'll, I'll make paints and stuff and dye them with those plants and minerals. Um, so these two paintings that I've just shown you are um, ones that were in Bar that I started in Barcelona and then I came back to the UK about two, three years ago and um, they kind of came back with me. Um, so you can see in the, in the, in the materials list that there's quite a range of different um, sort of Spanish and British kind of um, materials going in. Um, and I use this kind of, in these ones, I, I, it depends on where I'm showing them, but um, I put a shelf into these ones. So it, I'm not attached to how they're shown. It depends on the situation, but I uh, lived in Spain and I also lived in Italy for a long time. So I, and I studied old masters old master painting and a lot of altar pieces and I'm interested in the street altars um, that they have there and I, I love this idea of um, raising something up and there's a strong you'll see there's a thread a strong thread of kind of functionality that runs through the displaying of my work um, so that's I think that's where that's come from um, this is just another one where I'm kind of more wrapping this is one I made in Somerset where I'm wrapping flowers that I picked in the garden. 
Um, and I dyed it with calendula from the garden as well and tulips from a, a flower farm that I was growing at, working in that had been, um, couldn't be used to sell. They, they'd gone over. Um, other stuff in there that you can read. Um, and that's the little detail of that one. Um, so there is this very strong exper experiential element in the process of making the work, which does feel very private. Um, and I'm still fairly certain that I don't want to bring it in visually too much, um, except for perhaps the odd photo. And in general, I like that it's normally only signified in the use of the materials. Um, but I would be really interested to hear your thoughts if you have any, because it's something that I grapple with. It's very hard to get distance on your work sometimes, isn't it? Um, and often, so when I'm out in the landscape, it often looks very mundane. It's just kind of me rubbing leaves and feathers and soil onto, onto the blankets. Um, but if I can find a space where I'm not being watched, I, um, I also wear the blankets. And I, I use them as a kind of um, animal hide or a nest or a sort of transformative cloaking that allows me to access my sensual relationship with the landscape more easily. Um, and sometimes I cut holes in them to wear them so I can move about more freely or sometimes I just um, pull them around myself. Um, and sometimes it feels very performative and I can't get into it. And then sometimes it really does become something else. And um, I sort of, it's hard to explain, but I become kind of undone by my senses. Um, it's sort of the, the smell of the soil and the leaves and the touch of moss or dew or whatever it is, um, does something transformative. And um, I'm interested in, in, in following or trying to follow um, writers and thinkers like Donna Haraway and Guattari and Deleuze. Um, Guattari and Deleuze's um, idea of becoming animal and Donna Haraway's idea of becoming with something. I, I, I think that it's, yeah, this sort of undoing of human exceptionalism and trying to feel into the space of another's experience. Um, I do feel like the blankets do that for me sometimes, and it's it's quite a precious experience for me. Um, these photos are um, these photos are taken by a friend who I've been working with for about two years. The writer um, she's called Annabel Howard. She's an amazing writer, and I think I was able they're the photographs that sort of best express this feeling that I have when I'm in it. Um, a lot of the others haven't done that. I think it's probably because I was able to let go with her in a way that I can't with a lot of other people um, because I know that she sort of understands what I'm thinking about. Um, I just, yeah, and then a few more of the blankets. This this is one that I had for about three years. This was also in, in Barcelona as well. And um, I made a pocket and I put little bits of, I collected lots of little bits of wool that you find on um, uh, barbed wire, which sort of gets a bit manky and sad. Um, and I wanted to bring that together and um, make it into something, you know, give it some sort of something around a sense of care, like look after it somehow. Um, so I made a pocket and then, um, this one is a little one that I made last year um, from madder root in my garden. And I found goose feathers and saved French bean seeds in the pockets um, and lots of other things. I mean, this is not a comprehensive list of what's in it. It's just a, to give an idea of the things that have gone into it. Um, this one is my most recent one. Um, you can see here, I don't know if you can see my icon, but um, I stuffed the edges with lavender, uh, which is really nice because if you give it, a, if you give it a, a squidge, you can smell it. And um, I dyed it with weld and 
iron. Um, but this sort of strange um, watery feel came out of it when I put it in the water, which was really nice. Okay, these are just a few more pictures of uh, kind of performative stuff. This is, I just wanted to show you this because this is a blanket that I've actually cut a hole in the middle of and it sort of allows a different kind of um, experience in the landscape. It's much freer because I'm not kind of wrapping it around myself and often it means that I will dance a lot more. It feels more kind of airy and it's a different feeling but anyway. Um, yeah, so at a certain point, um, I bring the blankets back into the studio and I start to incorporate um, maybe more domestic or compromised or processed materials into it. Um, if you had a chance to read some of the material lists and the blankets, um, you maybe you saw kind of um, colour pencils or vodka or things like that, but I actually found the blankets quite limiting um uh their nature as a fabric just meant that i there's not i couldn't put them in i couldn't put so much stuff into it i couldn't really explore that so this new body of work has come out of an attempt to push the materiality of the of the of the works and kind of and i mean the blank i'll make the blankets too they're kind of supposed to go parallel with each other um and it, i want to move into a, like a it kind of explicitly move into a more intersectional space where um, I can look at um, the kind of convergences between climate breakdown and gender and health and decolonization through the materiality of the works. So I've been turning the blankets into kind of semi-functional objects and making paintings out of them. This is um, this is the, one of the first ones I made where I kind of built a pocket into it and filled it with lavender. Um, it's a shame because you it's, it's difficult with photographs. You can't really see how much it's in the pictures, but they're very, very thick. Um, and they're a big old mess of um, like natural pigments and um, house paint and uh, all kinds of different things. Um, and these ones are just two little ones that I made with similar kinds of materials but I just wanted to show you how I kind of was I've been building shelves into them which I also really like because I feel like and I might be wrong but it feels like for me that I'm kind of undermining the painting a little bit um with the whole heavy weight of the history of painting I kind of like that and I'm trying to raise um something else up an object that the viewer or whoever's hanging it could choose to put in it um, this is a more recent one that I made, um, where I'm really trying to push the tension of the materials in it. So I've got, you know, this juxtaposition of sun cream and clay and, um, washing powder and salt and so like, you know, I just, I was trying to really, I'm really trying to see how it feels to put all of these things together. Um, and there's a really nice quote or passage from a, from Eula Biss, who um, I just thought it might uh, sort of help cont contextualize the work a bit. She writes, if we do not yet know exactly what the presence of a vast range of chemicals in umbilical cord, blood and breast milk might mean for the future of our children's health, we do at least know that we are no cleaner even at birth than our environment at large. We are all already polluted we have more organisms in our guts than we have cells in our bodies. We are crawling with bacteria and we are full of chemicals. We are, in other words, continuous with everything here on earth, including and especially each other. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just interested in this idea that we are not as individuated as we thought. Um, and our skin is not a border, our houses are not borders. Um, we're beings permeated with microbes and microplastics, just like the landscape. Um, and we're deeply entwined in relationship with all of these things. Um, 
some of which are wondrous and some of which are very devastating. Um, yeah, and I think in the beginning I was, um, I think I had this idea with the blankets in the beginning that I just wanted to merge with the landscape. Um, I still do, but I was very interested in these kinds of, um, do you know, um, Anna Mendieta's Silhouetta series is a beautiful series and quite relevant for this conference, but um, I was sort of, I just wanted to kind of, yeah, merge, merge. And I, but I realized within that, that I had a kind of nostalgic understanding of what the landscape was, um, that the landscape was out there and that something in here, in here was kind of something else. Um, it was something different and out there was nature and in here was man-made and I wanted to belong to nature. And obviously we are nature and this is nature and nature is full of chemicals and plastics and we are full of chemicals and plastics. Um, and I'm, I'm just, um, as well as thinking about the emergence, I'm really interested in thinking about all of this stuff as well. So I've been kind of um, polluting the paintings with the materials I find around me, um, just kind of things like hundreds of thousands and sun cream and medicines and felt tips. And um, I've been making pillows and boxes um, and filling them with one use plastic and petals and stuff. Yeah, and, well, at the same time as all of that, the more man-made stuff, I've been um, making pockets and shelves to hold seeds and flowers and stones, and I paint them with rust and natural pigments. And I'm, I'm really trying through the tension and the materials to build some kind of nuance into the work. Um, I'm trying to acknowledge my complicity and my weakness and my care and my strange, strange humanness. Um, and I'm, I just, I wonder if through a kind of, deeper understanding of our interrelatedness um, and coming into contact contact with the degradation that we are all undergoing, um, we can move away from the individual into a place of collective care. Um, so that's what I'm really, that's kind of the core of what I'm trying to explain with the paintings. Um, I'm also, as well as trying to push the materiality, I'm trying to push um, this suggestion of functionality. So I've been making those the objects that you've seen before with the pockets and the shelves. But now I've, in the last few weeks, I've been trying to um, think about things that you can wear or hold, um, things that you can move around with and kind, kind of try to bring the blankets portability back in again. Um, and so the suggestion is that the paintings aren't static kind of an invitation to take them somewhere or to do something with them. Um, so this one is the next two that I'm going to show you are um, this, they're, they're boxes that I made and they're full of debris from my studio and non-recyclable plastics and um, petals and, and seeds. And then I've been painting on them and this one has a handle on it. Um, and these one, this one has ruck, rucksack straps attached to it. And um, again, I think it's just this suggestion of uh, possibility, the possibility of experiencing something with them or through them. And I, I'm looking forward to taking them out into the landscape. I haven't done it yet. Um, yeah, so that's the end of my chat, my, my talk. Um, thank you so much. I think there's some comments in the chat. Let's have a look. Um, oh, it's from, it's from Richard. I don't know how much time we've got left. Oh, not very much. Hey, Richard. Oh, I can't hear you. He's gone. you're muted um wonder if i can yeah can you sorry can you stop sharing your screen oh sorry yeah uh, yeah hey 
Um, I, you, bear with me for a sec, because I'm, I'm having to do three things at once. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next uh, session is uh, really complicated. <laughs> right, okay, I'm sorry, I'm back with you. So, um, yeah, I, um, I, we've had an earlier conversation about your work, and uh, I just find it uh, quite extraordinary, and I think the I don't know how much of the um, mm. sessions you've been able to um, catch st catch up with remotely, but there have been so many conversations about materiality and so many conversations about permeability, and you know it seems to be uh, uh, utterly in, what you're doing in this work seems to be uh, utterly in the zeitgeist mm. and kind of. Um, not that you're doing it, you're doing it very much in your own way. Um, uh, um, but really addressing some questions that are, are clearly very um, present. Um, and I'm just going to um, check in with our studio audience and, and see if there are any um, questions or comments from the floor in the couple of minutes that we have left. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not uh, just just some general feedback about lovely presentation, love the work, um, but I don't have any specific questions at the moment. So I, I'm just going to ask you where 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 are, you, where are you going next? I know you started to touch on that, so it'd be interesting to hear more about where you talk about wearables and. Where, where are you going to take the work next, do you think? I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of, because um, it's very new, but I like the idea of um, taking the one with the rucksack straps to the yes. woods and just seeing what happens. I don't, I have a sense that it's, um, you know, the same kind of, there's something about the kind of cloaking and, and, and wrapping around of the blankets that gives a kind of... Um, um, I think it's quite transformative and I don't think it'll be the same experience. So I'm, I'm curious to see what will happen with that. But I was thinking also, I, I, I like the idea of filling the paintings with um, protective herbs, um, you know, mm. herbs and uh, sort of just playing with what goes inside them as well. Mm. So, so there's a, a whole new alchemy there. Yeah. Is starting to come. I think we might have a question coming through oh, from great. Shri One. Um, I'm just waiting here for it to appear. I hope that they're well. But I'm not seeing it come through. So um, uh, we, we can certainly relay any questions or comments that, that do come through about the work. And uh, it's been great having you with us and sharing this work, which I think, you know, is making a very special contribution to this conversation. Thank um, you. And I hope you'll be able to check in some of the other sessions that yeah. are, are going on. So, Sophie, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you so much. Shout out also to Sophie Strand later, who's coming on. Okay, I will do. I will do. <laughs> thank you, you so know. much. And thank you all for, for listening. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Sophie. Bye. Hi, so I'm delighted to introduce Simone Kenyon, a name I've been familiar with for a long time. Um, uh, Simone's work is wonderful and everywhere, and uh, so we're delighted to have her here today. As I say, she should have been with us live. She's just down the road, um, but COVID is such that um, things sometimes get to change. So, Simone, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, and I will join you at the end of the session. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah, very strange to be just down the road in Ashburton, but unfortunately the COVID test is still looking a bit with a faint line, so I just didn't want to risk being in contact with anyone, but who knows? Hopefully I'll see some of you in person on the last day. My fingers are crossed everywhere. Um Okay, thanks everyone for inviting me to come and speak about my work at this conference. I'm so looking forward to connecting with everyone 
and um but yeah hopefully we can do it <laughs> via online as well um, so i'll talk a little bit about the project that i made in 2019 but ongoing it's an ongoing project and i'm going to see if i can share <laughs> not very tech savvy these days <laughs> um share my screen so you can see the powerpoint presentation um have a go at that. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to talk about um, Into the Mountain, the performance project I made a few years ago. And there is a, a lot of images that maybe I can share with you. Um, and I will describe it. But I just want to begin with... Um, reading a small excerpt from a description of, of part of the performance. Um, that's, yeah, so I'll begin with that just as a way of going into the work. Okay, so I'm going to begin by reading out this description of the actions of dancers involved in this project as a way to allow you to imagine the performance of Into the Mountain. Five women are scattered across the braes, close to the foothills of the plateau above. The expanse is large enough that you cannot capture them all in your gaze and you need to move your head to take in all the surrounding hills. They emerge from the heather and mossy ground, having sat in a place that they have returned to on these inclines. The jumpers they are wearing are a mixture of colours from the flora, fauna and wildlife of each season. Mossy yellows, deer grass greens, berry red, bell heather purple, blue sky mirrored in a lochen, white flash of tar white ptarmigan or mountain hare. You only see them once they are animated in action, running down the hillside feeling a way downhill that emerges from their reading of the ground and the foot, each following their own path of least resistance. Having sprung up like a bubbling, bubbling springlet from the earth, they trickle down, becoming rivulets, following gravity, gradually gaining momentum. Now you see the humanness of them, arms flailing, Rib cages high, lungs full of air, information revert reverberating through the legs that respond to the ever changing nature of the ground, lumpy tussocks and mini, mini hillocks of densities between hard rock and mossy softness, wiry heather roots, waterlogged patches, and exposed peat humps. Each footstep negotiates with micro attention and at speed, the response to the diversity of materials they come into contact with. Sometimes a woman disappears into the ground, choosing to go with the buckle of a knee or an ankle roll. She takes the rest of herself into the ground, a yielding to avoid injury and back up to verticality again. They gradually run down the hillside Gravity gathers them together as all rivulets joining become an eddy of water that runs around itself in circles, soon to become burn, then river. Their bodies find ways of moving together, searching for a pathway through the glen floor with an evident joy and collective fairness, gleaming the sense of each other's emergent wateriness and curiosity. Their faces are flushed with blood, body heat trapped in wool, hair damp from descending fog, breath audible, then visible as they reach us. So this description is a moment within the performance of Into the Mountain um, in May 2019. And it was part of an overarching project that explored women's relationship to the Cairngorms Mountains in Scotland through a curated program of events culminating in this place relational performance within the Glenfeshie area of the National Park. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Cairngorms Mountains in the northeast of Scotland, 
according to the Cairngorms National Park website. The Cairngorms are mountains that form part of the Grampians and are perhaps the most famous of the mountain ranges. The Cairngorm um, National Park covers an area of 1,748,000 square miles and it has various council areas including Aberdeenshire, Moray, Highlands, Angus, Perth and King Ross. So it's pretty big. Um, roughly translated as the Red Mountains, the Cairngorms got its name from the pink granite that would be the dominant colour of the mountains after the last glaciers retreated during the Ice Age and the freshly shattered um, granite rocks were exposed bare of soil and vegetation. Today, most of those sharp, freshly scattered rocks have been rounded by frost and snow and are a grey colour with a covering of lichens and mosses suited to the extreme high altitude life. The Cairngorms may be regarded as climatically, geomorphologi geomorphologically and biologically the most extensive Arctic area in the UK, making the whole area of considerable national and European importance. At the heart of this project is the text of Aberdeenshire writer Nan Shepherd, and the book is called The Living Mountain. Um, there's Nan Shepherd on a, on a five pound note, um, our Scottish five pound note. Um, and in this book, her words are recounting or are a recounting of her embodied experiences of the same mountains in post World War II in Scotland. These words guided and interwove their way through this creative process over many years, from being a dance maker as a sol as solo endeavors to this expanded group of collaborators, participants, performers, and mountain encounters. Shepherd's book was the first book I had encountered written by a woman about mountaineering experiences in this area. And it was a relief to read about mountaineering that moved away from the heroic male and colonialist narratives of conquering mountains. And crucially and more refreshingly than these usual daring do and risk taking accounts, her writing presents us with more detailed complexities of her embodied experiences as Hill Walker and her delicate ecological thinking and feeling space that proposes the permeabilities between human body and mountain ecology. I'm just going to write and um, read the first paragraph um, of or part of it um, from Nan Shepherd's book, The Living Mountain. Um, I guess it's important to say as well that she wrote this book in the second, just after the, or during the Second World War, but she then put it in a drawer after advice of it not being publishable <laughs> and it wasn't published until 1977, I think. So it sat in a drawer for many years. So there's also this kind of hidden, hidden words um, that unearthed themselves eventually. But I just wanted to read the opening paragraph. Summer on the high plateau can be delectable as honey. It can also be a roaring scourge. To those who love the place, both are good, since both are part of its essential nature. And it is to know its essential nature that I am seeking here. To know that is with the knowledge that is a process of living. This is not done easily, nor in an hour. It is a tale too slow for the impatience of our age, not of immediate enough import for its desperate problems. Okay. <laughs> I thought that was quite apt still, even now, in terms of our sense of time and feeling of space and time. Um, okay. So the project takes this key text of the living mountain as another way in creatively and acting as an invitation and and an initial guide from which to explore and develop new notions of sensing and of interconnectedness of bodily and socially ex social experiences with place. And it also reflects a part of the dialogical practices and desires that I had personally to learn from other women 
through finding mentors in various generations of women, um, either whether through text or through lived experience and conversation with others. Um, what is not visible in the opening description of those five women moving is this understory that these women, a lot of women alongside myself, my partner and our young baby at the time had been living together for a, over a month working towards these performances for a public audience. And as a group of dancers, we have intermittently for almost over a year come together in this way to meet and work with these mountains and explore different parts of the plateaus, ridges, contours, corries and ecologies. Um, once we had set upon a place to situate a performance work, we returned working in the foothills and walking the same routes daily for, the, for this month. When we came to know this place, close to two conjoining burns, the Alt Rua um, in Gaelic, it's um, the Red Burn and the Alta Cromelton. Um, it's probably very badly pronounced. I'm really sorry. My Gaelic is terrible. Um, and that is um, translates as the burn of the bending streamlet. So we situated ourselves between these two burns that eventually come together. And through our continual comings and goings and stravagings, which stravaging is, if you haven't heard it, is a Scots word for uh, meandering or wandering. Um, so the specifics of this place focused our interest, intentions, and the questions of making a site-specific performance work. And I'd invited this group of dancers to work on a performance that explored our entanglements with these mountains, with each other, and our growing community of people involved in the project. And this included a newly formed women's choir who performed a new composition created by Hannah Tabicki and, um, and singer Lucy Dunku. So the intensity of working in this way was not easy and the porosity and fluid fluidity of this continually expanding and contracting group can sometimes leave you the sensation of losing yourself in this mass multiplicity of, of it all. And so this is an an artistic process that really explores perspectives um, and feelings of porosity in various forms. So Into the Mountain did become an interdisciplinary project that explored and celebrated women's relationships with Scottish mountains through exploring these interconnections of the historical present and future narratives. And if Sarah Ahmed reminds us that gendering operates in how bodies take up space, then this project is a multi-channeled approach that invited women to come together and literally make space for themselves when discussing and embodying their relationship with mountains. And the work aimed to bring validity to these experiences and histories through the creation of events and spaces to consider and witness how women connect with this environment. Maybe there's a precursor to that I went to explain that when I was working maybe eight years ago on this research, it began with having many conversations with other women about how they might try to describe their embodied experiences of, of mountaineering in this particular area. Um, and, I, and what came from those over 60 conversations with people from all across the world, actually, um, was this sense of just wanting to share this collective experience and often feeling um, yeah, unconfident about their um, experiences and how we even share them. So that really motivated me to continue with the work. So there's this very social element to the project. Um, the project endeavoured to work with an all women team across the whole production, including the mountain leaders, um, experiential facilitators, artistic mentors, production management team, so roughly around 35 women in the core of the project's creation. And Into the Mountain as a wider project, themes and practices in, were really centered around embodiment, ecological performance making, and thinking about outdoor leadership, 
when working and training and performing in relation to these mountainous terrains. And the full program of curated events included um, a sort of a whole plethora. I'm going to just go through some of these slides. Sorry, I'm getting busy. This is the this is the plateau. Um, so you can have a sense of well, just the the shapes and the, the colours of that, but in this kind of mass like, expanse of it. Um, I'll leave that here for now. Um, so yeah, there was out, an outdoor education program with schools across Aberdeenshire and CPD workshops with outdoor and woodland learning teachers and exploratory workshops for professional dancers. And then we raised money and worked with Mountaineer in Scotland to provide two traineeships, um, mountain leader traineeships for women, um, as well as talks and events. And then this long day symposium that happened in the Central Belt in Glasgow. And also a, a newly commissioned film by the National Theatre of Scotland, as well as Scottish Sculpture Workshop, which is actually in the programme, um, which I made with Lucy Cash, um, called How the Earth Must See Itself, so that you'd be able to see that, that film as part of the programme. So this programme culminated in this performance event, which consisted of a series of guided walks for three groups of audiences, um, and they converged and witnessed this performance deep within the Glenfeshi area of the Cairngorms. Now, the Glenfeshi area is, is well known for its rewilding projects, including the Cairngorms Connect reforesting project. Um, and so in the context of dancing within this Glenfeshi ecology, human intervention is very much apparent in its ecological fabric. Um, and with these rather sort of relatively recent tree planting projects, culling of deer to preserve pine and birch saplings, um, which also, you know, from a human perspective, also reduces the tick population as well in that area. So very useful when you're rolling around in the heather and the undergrowth. Um, but in turn, this, this enhances the biodiversity of this particular ecology. And also the tree line has been rising in that area. Um, so we began to learn much more about the land management practices, um, um, such as the Cairngorms Connect project, which has this 200 year vision to enhance this habitat and species and the ecological processes within the national park. So these very well intentioned um, collaborative interventions that shape the environment longer term, but I guess our human understanding of what is valued in terms of of that rewilding is very much woven into that narrative as well so i guess we will come into this place where um, we're often asking if we come to dance this place what parts are we actually dancing are we really dancing the multiplicity of the place and its complex web of relations and this includes our human <laughs> um i guess design on that as well so I'm interested in how these, the role of these environments have on our human perception of it and how this perception is culturally and somatically experienced and expressed through our bodies. And in particular, I'm interested in how the, the, this relationship between the gendered dancing and mountaineering body is in relation to these lively dynamics of the mountain ecology. So these are very old photographs now, they're just of some winter. So I was going in and learning and understanding these this place through all the seasons. And also when I was pregnant with my son. So this is just finishing my mountain leader training just after six months pregnant. And just also that, you know, to highlight these elements of also like how how do we do that? as mothers, how do we do that as people growing other humans? Um, yeah, so there's a kind of long story <laughs> that evolves. And, um, these are the, the dancers and, so, and the facilitators, some of them in this picture who I worked with. Um, and here they're just looking through their, their legs 
and looking at the world upside down, which is a proposition that Nan Shepherd um, offers in the book. And so that is something that features consistently through through the work, like very simply, how do we see the world through different perspectives or angles and you know quite physically how do we do that in a, in the most simplest way um and yeah so that's just an image of them kind of practicing that this is hannah and lucy the the um composer and and singer we were working on site there and this is some images of the symposium that we did in glasgow so it was sold out you know there was an appetite to discuss the relationship between arts and mountain mountaineering and I, I feel like yeah it still feels very it's still part of a big journey this is some of the workshop participants happening um doing things in in that symposium and this is one of the postcards we made for the education packs um that that we gave to the school. So I'll just leave that there for you to read. Um, so <clears throat> Shepard's interest in the ideas of this felt porosity between our physical self um, and the world connected to also the philosophies and approaches with, with body weather dance training that I've been engaged with for over 15 years or so that explores directly the practice um, and the ideas of the body's permeability and dancing with or in place. And from personal experience, that body where the practices invoke this deeply ecological approach to dancing, which includes the social, cultural and political aspects of framing and contextualising how we're moving and why we're moving and the choices we're making. So this research was really trying to consider this felt intersubjective and interconnected experiences of place and considering Shepherd's text along with these practices and ways of facilitating bodily and ecological awareness through somatic practices such as um, the Feldenkrais method, as well as through mountaineering skills. And these approaches were explored within this same geographical environment as a shepherd. So through the project, we tried to explore what Doreen Massey might term as place as process. And so we're not necessarily looking for this definitive answer, but it's this ongoing understanding about the complexities and then the complexities of facilitating and designing performance experiences within and for this particular environment. So it's, it's really brought about these new senses or orientations and approaches of how we might navigate across potentially outdoor facilitation and environment related performance making. And I guess I'm interested in how we might create these new collaborative potentials between the two fields that might seem seemingly seem quite separated, but um, I do actually think there's an interesting um, relationship to be had, especially thinking about potentially new modes of outdoor leadership um, and facilitation and vice versa, um, how they can both relate, feed into each other. So this is the element of the work where my interest lies more on how that knowledge and the commitment of dance and somatic practices can maybe contribute to a more nuanced understanding and pedagogies within mountaineering and mountaineering training, for example. Um, yeah, I'm just looking at the time, <laughs> just thinking. So I guess how we create, yeah, there's also a big question as performance makers and movers that I still don't have the answer to, but I guess it's an ongoing thing of like, how do we create work that decenters the human, whilst of course acknowledging that as humans we are experiencing feeling things from this very embodied vantage point and perspectives? And how do we work and create from this ecological approach? Um, and what does the process of making work teach us along the way each time we're considering our ethics and artists um, as artists and makers? 
So I guess there is that point of moving, like questioning how dance has the potential to move away from an anthropocentric perspective, whilst acknowledging that these cultural and social constructions of place are really embedded within our understanding and our interactions with, with the world. And how, how can we affect or shape new ways of, of coming to that? understanding and how do we shape our understanding of environments um so this links to this historical perspective of humans understanding of environments and in this instance the mountainous environment environments and of course it's all connected we're all connected mountains do not exist separately from our wider ecology but it was helpful helpful to focus and frame some of these explorations within this specific context and see how or offer ways in connecting to the personal, local, and globalized interrelationships with um, our understanding of mountaineering culture. Um, Timothy Morton writes in his book, Ecological, Being Ecological, that philosophy means the love of wisdom, not wisdom as such, he writes. Love means you can't and don't grasp the beloved. That's what you feel. That's what you realize when you love someone or something. I can't quite put my finger on it. I just love the, that painting. Or in this case, those mountains, those plants, those things that make, make it all up into the mountains. So this work and the process is really coming from the love of a place, just as Nan Shepherd wrote in The Living Mountain also. And we are often asked as artists what our dance work is about. And I don't often work this way or even know how to answer that question. If it is about anything, it is this, grappling at the edges, feeling and making tangible all those things you love or concern you, the things you can't quite put your finger on or make sense of in a sort of linear way. This is listening to this messy entanglements and trying to make sense the best you can with others. So into the mountain is a practice of understanding how we engage with ongoing learning of making deeper ecological work and its implications for wider ongoing discussions with mountaineering cultures and dance. And I'll just spend a minute going through a visual journey because I can't multitask and talk and read and do the slides at the same time. So I'll just be quiet and let you have a sense of some of the process and then there'll be a sense of the documentation of the journey that the performance took in May Thank you. If anyone's got any questions, feel free to ask. Thanks. Thanks, Simone. Um, could you unshare your screen now and then we can then we can see you and unfortunately me as well on the screen. <laughs> um, 
it, there's so much, there's so many things that we could talk about in this uh, session, and uh, I think uh, there's been quite a bit of conversation going on around uh, Nan Shepherd, hardly surprising. The, I mean, for me, I think it's wonderful that you've been one of the people who has reclaimed that work, which, you know, of there have been there have been those reclamations. You know, there have been Aldo Leopold and uh, Rachel Carson, who've both been kind of in a way reclaimed from uh, to, to a certain level of obscurity. But Nan Shepherd's work just speaks so much to um, so many contemporary questions that it's it's absolutely extraordinary that that we have found that work again and it's come back into the uh, the, the current. Conversation and there's a comment here from uh, from the studio just 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 as a reminder really that Nan <coughs> Shepherd was born in 1893 and was a senior lecturer in English at Aberdeen for most of her working life, but pointing out that actually women weren't allowed to graduate from Oxford until the 1950s. I mean, <laughs> just extraordinary um, level of things, but I'm also very interested in, um, uh, and actually there's another uh, comment again from, I think it's probably um, uh, uh, Rob Harriet. I think is probably putting in these comments. He says, uh, it's also worth knowing that the nonconformist, um, as in Unitarians, Methodists, Quakers, etc., um, were barred from attending the established universities due to their religious beliefs. Um, but there were certain places that were admitting uh, uh, and uh, awarding degrees. Um, sorry, this is quite hard to read. It's quite a long comment. <laughs> uh, anyway, but I think um, the point is that that voice was her voice was clearly one that was highly regarded uh, and and highly acknowledged. <laughs> But I, I'm also really interested in this work you're doing across the cultures of mountain leadership and uh, and those and, and those and those artists who are making work in these in these extraordinary wild spaces. And and you did reference um, rewilding slightly. And I I would love to know what you where that sits within this conversation. This notion of rewilding, particularly in. Uh, uh, a landscape like the Scottish Highlands or the Scottish Mountains. Um, well, we are opening a whole can of worms there. Oh, oh, I know, I know. It's, <laughs> uh, it's a huge can of worms. So I, I very unfairly... Just, I, uh, I um, yeah, tentatively... <laughs> Oh, yes, I always feel very nervous talking about rewilding these days. I don't know, it's often... Uh, I. I kind of watch from the sides of, you know, rewilding private Facebook groups and never quite sure where to place myself. Um, I guess, yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting, there's so many approaches and opinions about rewilding in Scotland that's really taking, taking off. Um, it's a big conversation in Scotland these days. And I think, you know, some people meet it with, uh, with some cynicism around like who's managing it and the power of that and you know but there's also some very interesting community-led rewilding projects and I think you know it's not just about the land management per se and who it's a who who gets to decide you know it keeps coming back to for me the interest in that is like yeah who gets to make the decisions and I guess there's still these elements of like a, a colonial um, behaviour in Scotland that is still very, very real and very felt by generations of the Scots. So it's it's an important discussion to be having. Uh, uh, I think. Uh, sorry. Oh. Sorry, go on. <laughs> but I think if I keep if I if I bring it if I always bring it back to these. Ex experiences or physical experiences um watching watching the the new forestation growth is really fascinating and i also think the ideas of of thinking beyond our own human time frame in terms of of what 
how you manage land beyond the 50 years or the you know beyond production um is really interesting to kind of sit with that in our bodies when we're out mountaineering and and to be able to understand that a bit more but it's yeah it, i mean there's some interesting work happening robbie singh and um amanda thompson and elizabeth reader are actually currently working in the cairngorms national park on part as part of the cairngorms connect project and they so they have commissioned artists around the world to look at various rewilding projects and to respond to them so it'd be interesting to see yeah what they mm. what they find or what they kind of um how they might articulate that next uh, yeah that thank you that and, and i think absolutely we need to move on in a second but uh i think the work that you're doing there we're doing there with the, the mountain leaders uh it's doing exactly that it's kind of opening up that cultural conversation in a way that's embodied and felt um uh, and is hopefully to some degree cutting across that very quite toxic debate in many ways about rewilding and how people live and, and work in the landscape um, so yeah. it feels really important work in that sense thank you yeah I mean I feel like hmm, there's still a long way to go to convincing you know mountain leadership um, training in particular that dancers have have some value to that but I absolutely believe that we do and um, if anyone else wants to talk to me about that I would love to because I sometimes feel quite alone in my endeavor in in that respect but um I do th I do think the training and the pedagogy of mountain leadership training is changing gradually and I think yeah you just need that openness to adding I mean it's often under this kind of guise of like added extra of the training but um sure. yeah. I think if we can begin to change the language around yeah. yeah um and just move you know just add these qualities and and details in to what is essentially the kind of very still quite old hegemonic kind of ways of working with and, and quite gendered too presumably oh absolutely yeah and of course well, those are the kind of words we won't start now because <laughs> we, need to, we need to move on uh, so thank you so much for being with us uh, i hope thank you'll be able you. to get back to us physically before the event's yeah, over me too um, and uh i'm going to hand back to uh to the studio floor now if you want to leave your webinar okay. uh, i'll do the same all right thank you yeah. bye right, bye So this um, is Paula Murphy is going to present now, and the title of her presentation is uh, Ecosomatics and Teacher Education, Exploring Ways into Somatic Engagement. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for coming along today. It's lovely to see faces of friends that I've been making over the last few days, and I really, really appreciate you coming. Um, today, I'm, I'm going to talk about um, some of my research into the area of embodiment in teacher education. And I've been working in the area of drama education in the School of Arts, Education and Movement in Dublin City University. I've been working there for over 20 years now, and I am at the analysis stage of my PhD. And I'm going to share with you some of the emerging findings, particularly those that are related to the outdoor dimension of the fieldwork. Um, and in sharing uh, my research with you today, I'm responding to the invitation of the organizers to, um, to share practices and research um, that explores the impact of somatic practices and principles outside the context of dance. And reading um, their invitation here, um, this is one of the questions in, in the invitation. How can such a way of knowing be trained, passed on, and how can it inform new fields within dance and movement practices, as well as become relevant 
beyond the field of dance. And this is the outline of my presentation. I'll give you a little bit of background in terms of where I'm coming from with this, the research frame, the research context, an overview of a module that I developed with my own students around somatics, and then preliminary findings, as I said, in relation to the outdoor element. So how did I come uh, to engage with, with somatic principles, not being a dancer, not being a therapist in background, but being an educator, a drama educator? Um, as I said, I worked in that field for, for 20 years, but in 2012, um, I began uh, an accreditation in somatic education and movement at the Gorse Hill Centre in Greystones, just outside Dublin in Ireland. And uh, at this beautiful place, I thought I was just going for uh, to attend one module, but I just couldn't stop. And I came back for more and more. And this turned into a full accreditation. Um, and this this the director of this program, you may have heard of her. I think some of you have who I've spoken to. And this is yes, I hear her. <laughs> this is Joan Davis, who is the director of the program. And, and Joan is a real pioneer of contemporary dance in Ireland and of somatics in the country. So anybody you meet from Ireland who is working in this area will probably have worked with Joan. Um, and as you can see, she has done training in a whole range of areas and worked with um, some very um, uh, enlightened people in this field, namely uh, Bonnie Bainbridge Cohen, um, and she's also studied extensively in the area of authentic movement. Um, she's written a number of books, which you may want to have a look at. The Maya Lila um, is uh, about a creative process in nature. Um, and then she has written more recently in 2018, this book on origins, which is the process that I went through myself. Um, the other thing to say about Joan is that she has developed her, her practice largely outside the field of academia, which was an interesting uh, element for me. Um, in terms of the programme itself that, that I went through, uh, it involved a lot of different elements. It was a four and a half year process. It was a very personal process for me. It, it had a, a therapeutic orientation, uh, but it was very wide reaching in terms of its scope, as you'll see from the areas uh, listed here. And um, the philosophy behind the program was very much um, based on a belief that the quality of the embodiment of the facilitator is directly linked with the quality of the embodiment of those that he or she works with. Um, and so the challenge of the application, or, or the challenge for me and the other people who attended this work, and we were all coming from a range of areas, was to explore how we might apply this in our own contexts. And this led again to another unexpected. Uh, this led to my, my PhD research. And the research question at the heart of my PhD is, what do the principles and practices of somatic movement education offer in the context of an arts education module within a teacher education program? And I, I don't think I mentioned already, when I say teacher education, um, it's, it's, it's students who are learning to be primary school teachers that I'm working with. And um, so they are generalist teachers. They're not um, training to be dancers or professionals or anything like that. So that's important for you to be aware of. And I think it's important as well, if you can, to try and bring a beginner's mind uh, to this as, as you as you listen to the work that we have done, because this was very new and somewhat strange for some of them in the early stages. Um, okay, and, and more specifically here, I'm looking at what is the relevance of this work in this context? And I'm, I'm looking at research and education and teacher education there. What is the impact on the student? And, and what impact might this have on our teacher education pedagogy, which is already quite uh, expansive and inclusive and wide ranging as it is. Uh, I'm working uh, at the intersection of three fields, as you can hear from the research question, teacher education, arts education and somatic education. And the, the research methodology is predominantly um, uh, phenomenological 
you always have to take a run at that word in nature, um, because it was the experiences of the students and, and my own experiences that I was interested in in relation to the research question. But because my own process was very much at the heart of the work as well, it also took in elements of autoethnography and arts informed principles as well. Um, OK, I worked with I devised a module which is is, is ever being devised. It's, it's in it's always been continued. Um, and I worked with three core, three groups of students over a two year period for my field work. Um, in 2019, I worked with a B.Ed group, B.Ed three students. Um, and these are students who are generalist students, but they're specializing in the arts and particularly drama. And so this was one of five modules in drama that we looked at the embodiment uh, work in. And then in 2020, I worked with an, another group of third year students and also a group of postgrad students, a small group of postgrad students. And the third year students are around 19, 20 in age, and the postgrad students are between 20 and 30. Um, and I think that's all I want to say about the, the students themselves. I just want to say something as well about the context, the, the broader context and the immediate context for this work. Um, because as we know in all of our research, this is what helps to give meaning to, to the, the, the outcomes of the, of the project. Um, and, and this has come up a number of times at the conference, but um, I needed to be conscious of the system that I was working in. Um, and in terms of education more broadly, um, it has been beset since uh, the early, early Greek philosophy, the work of the early Greek philosophers and more profoundly then in the Enlightenment era with, um, with dualistic understandings of how, how, how humans function. And in terms of an understanding of learning and of knowledge, mind is separated from body in this paradigm, um, person is separated from environment in this paradigm. And while this may feel like old news, unfortunately, my, my research in the literature and in my own experience would tell me that we are still beset with hangovers from this uh, paradigm in our work, in spite of our best efforts uh, with reform. And um, it, within such a paradigm, the role of a, a teacher, a primary school teacher, um, is, is, you know, all about being a conduit a transmitter of knowledge, a transmitter of curriculum. And then their, their value, their effectiveness is, is measured by how effective they are in terms of transmitting that curriculum. And this, this, this comes back in various ways over the centuries. And again, in the neoliberalism of the current time and the focus on outcomes and measurement and testing, we find that it's coming back again. So it's a hard one to push against, um, as I said, in spite of of our best efforts. Um, however, the good news is there is, uh, as, as you are all familiar with, a different school of thought and a different school of thought influencing teacher education as well. And, and here I'm going to um, quote Van Manen, who, um, who, who talks about what he feels is the kind of knowledge that is necessary to becoming an effective teacher. He says, professional knowledge is pathic to the extent that the act of practice depends on the sense and sensuality of the body. Personal presence, relational perceptiveness, tact for knowing what to say and do in contingent situations, thoughtful routines and practice, and other aspects of knowledge that are in part pre-reflective, pre-theoretic, and pre-linguistic. And one of the questions that Manon asks is how do we facilitate this kind of knowledge in our student teachers? Um, and, and, and one area that comes up in, in relation to this, surprise, surprise, is the arts. And Eisner, a researcher in arts education, um, talks about the arts as, as a site for encouraging this kind of sensitive responsiveness in education and in teacher education. Um, 
and and what he calls qualitative knowledge, which is what he feels teachers need. So the arts, he says, teach students to act and judge in the absence of rule, to rely on feel, to pay attention to nuance, to act and appraise the consequences of one's choices and to revise and then make other choices. Getting these relationships right requires what Nelson Goodman calls rightness of fit. So the arts may be um, a place for this, the development of this kind of qualitative judgment that he refers to, um, but it's not as straightforward as that often. And even in the arts, we can find that we are beset with hangovers from these from the traditional paradigm that I mentioned earlier on. And Davidson uh, explains to us by virtue of the fact that the arts are placed with the dis within the disembodied framework of a knowledge that dominates schools, the capacity of the arts to support an embodied framework of knowledge must be to some extent compromised. And, and when I talk to my own colleagues who work in arts education, um, they, they find that they and their students are struggling against this culture that still, even in the arts, you know, works with a demonstrate, then do it, think about it, then draw, decide what you're going to do and find your outcome and so on. And, um, and, and it's difficult for the students then because they move into this culture and they're pushing against that. Um, so so this, this is where, um, where I, I, I start to think about or introduce to you the practices that I, that I did with my own students. Um, and in this, this module that I developed, and it's just ten, between 10 and 11 sessions, depending on the year, depending on bank holidays and so on. Uh, so it's quite short. Um, but what, what, I, what I'm going to do now is, is show you kind of the broad brushstrokes of the content of the module. Um, um, first of all, there was um, a dedicated focus um, on somatic principles and practice. And this would be new. Um, you know, maybe in, in my work previously, it was kind of inherent in the work, but I didn't um, provide a dedicated focus on feeling the body from the inside um, as, as Hannah talks about. Um, so in the early stages, I was trying to find ways in that were accessible to them through, through means that may be familiar to them. Meditation, yoga, um, dance, a little bit of dance. Um, and then I started to gradually bring in um, gently principles uh, from um, developmental movement work, uh, learning to yield, learning to push, learning to feel the body in relation to the environment around them. And he, these are all images from the module. Um, and, and I also then, in the third session of that first iteration of the module, I brought them uh, to the local botanic gardens, which for what I thought was going to be just one session <laughs> in the outdoors. But this turned out to be so significant in the process that, I, that this became much more central uh, in the work. And, um, and, and I want to say more about that in a little while. Um, the, the whole, the relationship between somatic education and creativity uh, was an important part of the work. And as we went on in the module, they had opportunities to uh, explore um, their own body feel in relation to poetry, in relation to movement, in relation to drama, um, in relation to painting. This the, the, the painting work here that you see, that came out of um, an exploration of the fluid body, and that was influenced by uh, body-mind centering uh, body systems work. So, um, so it was it was, as I said, a quite different way of working for them. Um, and here's other images of, of some of the creative work that we engaged in. So, as I said, the in, in terms of the outdoor develop, uh, uh, work, um, what we decided to do was to work on a very simple site specific piece back in the Botanic Gardens later on in the module. And for the first cohort in 2019, this was just like, like a simple piece that they had to create in groups of five or six. Uh, they had to choose a part of the garden, and we had been visiting it, um, that, uh, that spoke to them, that they felt connected with. 
and they had to find aesthetic ways of bringing their classmates into connection with that space uh, in, a, in a somatic way, in a creative way. And so we wandered around the gardens from one group to the other as we went through that. And for the second group, unfortunately, a pandemic arrived. So um, just before we got to that stage of the course, so they developed um, they developed creative projects in relation to their local environment. And I was interested to hear about the work that um, Rachel and her colleagues are doing here and that, that similar kinds of things happen for them in their course. Um, you, you, you have to work with the situation you're in and sometimes it brings nice surprises with it. Um, okay, so in terms of the data that I collected, this mainly came from the student journals which um, had a digital dimension. They could put images and videos and various things into those journals. My own journals that I kept throughout the process, their assignments, uh, pre and post module questionnaires. And then I conducted um, uh, interviews with 15 students after the, the process, and they were an hour long each and also included a somatic dimension in them. So, I mean, I can only give you just a slice of what's, what's coming through. Um, but um, I, I'm gonna share with you some uh, statements from the students, just first of all, on the general impact, and then we'll come to the outdoor dimension. So this is from a post-grad student. She said, it's relevant to teaching in many ways. First, I have an appreciation for the importance of movement and the senses in learning, and will therefore aim to incorporate that into my planning and teaching. It also helps me as a teacher to be more present in class, allowing me to engage fully with the children, think on the spot and be flexible. So we're moving quite far away already from that transmission model that, that I talked about earlier on. Um, and this student, somatic education has forced me to think about the value of this embodied wholeness in oneself. Reflecting on the experience, I've come to realize that the type of teacher I am stems from within. And this is this is really echoing um, the direction that that you know that researchers and writers in teacher education want us to go in now, is is to make sure that our work is just as much about teacher identity as it is about theory and curriculum and so on, about the person of the teacher. From this module, I've learned to allow children to explore and the openness you as an educator need to allow the children to do that. I have found this module has led me to have more of a sense of letting go, which I would like to bring into the classroom. And so here she's, she's relating and she's understanding the impact of her own disposition and the shifts that may be taking place there and the experience of the children. So just to return to the somatic, the ecosomatic element, um, and the and its impact on the process. So I'm just going to share a little bit here. And what came through in in terms of the the what the students and 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 in my own reflections here is a deeper connection with nature, enhanced somatic sensitivity, enhanced creativity, and an influence on their understanding of the nature of learning. Um, the, the deeper connection with nature. This is just an example of the, the kind of thing that's coming through here. I also began to see nature in many aspects of myself, like how blood vessels flow, like rivers, and how the birds flying in formation look almost like liquid spilling. It is so strange how we are all connected. You can hear the newness of this for her. This is really familiar for, for people here, but this was quite a, a discovery. Um, for them, this sense of connection. It has taken me a very long time to get out of my head and to view the world in this way. But now that I can, it is so much more enjoyable and fascinating. So the impact, you know, I think we can see here a shift from an intellectual kind of orientation to a more holistic orientation. And then the impact on her affective spark, I guess, uh, is what, what I, would, I would hear in this. And this is from um, an interview that I did with one of the students. Um, and this, this I think, really 
I, I find I find very interesting and helpful in terms of something that became clearer and clearer for me as I went along. And I've heard it a lot in the discussions over the last few days. The impact, I mean, I think initially I was very much, you know, helping them to explore from the inside and focusing on the internal, but getting clearer and clearer about how the external environment supports that. Um, and I think we can hear that in this student's observations. And, and because it's an interview, it's a lot more chatty, the style. Um, yeah, it, that was really new as well. I haven't done anything like that before. And I really, really enjoyed that. I don't know. I felt more, when we were doing the movement and meditation in the room in the college, I felt a bit more curious and a bit giggly and a bit more nervous to try it. But when we were outside, I felt more open to it. I don't know what that was, but I felt more free in doing it and experimenting in it. I don't know. Maybe it was because I remember at one point we were looking up at the sky and you said, it's so open. And I felt that. I really did feel that when we were doing the movement pieces, that we were more, I felt more stretched out or something. So you can hear her kind of um, finding the words for 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 her for this new experience. Um, and then in terms of creativity and how the natural world supported that, it felt really therapeutic and relaxing to focus on nature and allow my senses and feelings to take over and guide my creation. It gave my mind a chance to slow down and not to have to think about what I was doing or creating. I felt drawn to certain items I had gathered. There was no particular reason for this interest and something that I would have thought to be quite ordinary suddenly stood out from everything else. And I think what's interesting here is, is, is her letting her senses and her feelings guide the direction of the work. So, so what does all of this bring to teacher education pedagogy? That is all that already, you know, focused on reflection, that's already focused on identity. What is it that this ecosomatic approach is bringing? And for me, what I'm seeing that in the research is it's this kind of magical uh, mix that um, that occurs between focusing on somatic movement principles, bringing in an artistic frame, and also allowing nature to be the teacher. And I think it's this mix that's, uh, that's bringing about these shifts in disposition and understanding. From my own journal, in after that session three, which was quite significant in terms of a shift in the course. And it, it is in this sense that I'm beginning to recognize its power over and above other forms of stimulus. There was something of the recognition of self body in nature, the mirroring of that alongside the power of nature to affect sensation, emotion, calm in the body that began to become clear to me during and in the days following the session. And finally, from a student who, this is from the second cohort, and they created their own projects in their local area on their own. And she was very much guided by the principles of the course, developing her own pedagogy around her, her creative process. And in, in her process, she is saying, I yielded to the hard stone slab beneath me, fully appreciating my interaction with both the ground and the sky like we experienced when observing the baby learning to walk and the dancers engaging with the floor through push and pull. I again forest bathed, really drinking in my surroundings. The sounds of the birds, the feel of the sun, the hot on my neck, the slight breeze in my hair and the cold hard ground beneath me. And through adopting somatic approaches, I had become accustomed to creativity found me. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know if we have time for observations and questions or. Okay. Yeah, if, they, if anybody has any observations or questions, we might just take a minute or two. Well, thanks, that was great. Um, um, I found myself thinking all the time, yes, primary education, wonderful, 
I mean, that's you know been my field for a long time. Oh, hello. And you just have to speak into the doctor. Oh, okay. Sorry, I don't mind. Yeah, I was just thinking primary education, wonderful. What about secondary education? Yes. Yeah, we yeah. say that all the time. What about yeah. secondary education? Yeah. And, and I these think students will have had, will, yeah. will have come through secondary. Yeah. Um, and I think, that, yes, yeah. thank you for raising that. No, I'm good with this. <laughs> um, that's something that really came through in the interviews and so on is um, how critical they became of their secondary education in light of all of this. Um, I, I don't know what it's like here in the, the UK, but there's a huge, we have the leaving certificate in Ireland and it's linked with your point. You get all of these points and that links with your access to third level. And um, it is, it, it is definitely more traditional than the primary. Um, so yes, there's a lot of work to be done. The good news that we had in Ireland recently is that they have decided to bring drama, theatre and film studies in as a new subject on the Leaving Cert curriculum. So that's that's a big um, plus. And hopefully that will bring more diversity in terms of opportunities for learning and, and learning styles and so into that context. But yeah, that's a big question. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Really loved it. I'll talk to you at lunch more in detail, but um, I'm really interested in and in sort of, I guess it's quite early on in terms of analysing the results. But um, so I work at university. So at a university, not everyone has to go through classic teacher training to become a university lecturer. So yeah. we have a real mix of people, some who've do, done PGCEs, some who've come through as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. So I'd be really interested just on your reflections as like this as a as a, a cpd process so rather than a module when someone's coming in do you think there's the potential for this to be adapted into something that maybe you've yeah. been teaching for 20 years and actually you're going to come to this later or do you think oh, the yeah. freshness of the student is is the crucial thing okay that's that's an interesting question so I did while I was doing my accreditation I did a summer course with experienced teachers at one point, I did a week with them. And um, and that was I really, really enjoyed that because um, again, it, it was it was very different. But there was again that it was quite new for them, but they brought their experience to bear on it. It, it became a way of of them reflecting on their own work. Um, and I have come across another research project. Her name escapes me right now of a woman in the States who did work with people who are um, uh, moving from other countries to the States and have to do a one year program to, you know, to work in that context. And she used, um, I, I think she used somatic methods as a, a way of helping them reflect on their careers. So I think it really would support reflection in that context, but also practice. Yeah. Good. Great. Thank you. Good yeah. <laughs> I'd love to do more of that too. Yeah. People might be hungry, Paula. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. That's great. Thank you.